Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Marketing Your Farm prod Products. This is a Cultivating Success, Your Small Farm 2018 webinar. We're really happy to have you on today's webinar. Today's presenter is going to be Jen Worland, and Jen is in Teton County, Idaho, and she'll be talking about how you can be effective in direct marketing your farm products. I'm Colette De Phelps, and I'm one of the coordinators of this webinar series, and I'd like to go over some tips for this webinar program. So, Jen, if you could advance the slide to the webinar tips, it would be great. So there's a picture of Jen, and here's our webinar tips. So sometimes when rubbing, running a webinar, you might be running into some problems with speed or sound. To help with that, we recommend that you close all of the other programs that are running on your computer. And if you have a continual problem with your sound, you might consider calling in on the phone instead of using the sound through your computer. If you call in on the phone and that number is provided in your welcome email, you'll want to mute your computer sound so you don't get feedback. You have a question box in your control panel that is on the left hand, or the, sorry, the right hand side of your screen. At any time, you can type questions for the presenter in that question box, or if you're having any problems with your sound or the speed of viewing your screen and the slides moving, please let us know and we can let you know if that's an issue on your side or if that's with the overall program. Today's slide handout is available as a download from your computer. In your control panel, you'll see a toggle that says handouts, one of five. At any time, you can download that handout onto your computer. So we encourage you to do that as it has a copy of all the information that's provided today. This webinar is also being recorded, and following the webinar, you'll be able to find it posted on the Cultivating Success website. So with those tips, I'm going to go ahead and hand the presentation off to Jen. Thanks, Colette. Okay, so um, we have a little poll to get started. And we're wondering who is in the audience today? If you could um, look at your poll and then just type in who you are. So half of our participants have voted, 88%. Uh, we'll give it a couple more seconds if you'd like to vote. Okay, 100% of folks have voted. I will close and share the results of that. So on today's webinar, 88% of our participants are beginning farmers with one to 10 years experience, and 13% are technical advisors with extension or other organizations. So great, thanks for joining us today. Okay, we have another poll, just figuring out some demographics here. So where are you located? Seventy-five percent of our folks have voted, eighty-eight percent. Okay, we'll just give it one more second if you'd like to vote. Okay, 100% have voted. I'm closing that and sharing the results. So 38% of our participants today are in North Idaho, 25% are in Southwest Idaho, 13% in Central Idaho, 13% in South East Idaho, and 13% outside of Idaho. So great, thank you for joining us. Okay. So to get started, um, when developing a marketing plan or strategy, it all starts with your brand. So I want you to start thinking about who you are and what your brand um, is or may be. So this is your persona. 
And it starts with your goals, your vision, and your mission. So developing this is really integral to getting started and to having a clear marketing strategy. So this, since this is your persona, it's, you first need to get to know who your ideal customer is. And also, what type of products are you going to sell or do you want to sell? And know that you are inextricably connected to your brand, your personal life, and so forth is also your brand. So this is you, and be authentic. So I often say, you are your brand, and your brand is you. Know that most customers are not consciously aware of their purchasing habits and they buy items based on a whim and often because of marketing. They'll see a flashy logo or a picture that resonates with them and that often is what gets people to buy products. So how you can get ahead and reach your, so this is really important for getting ahead and reaching your customer. This all has to do with knowing your ideal customer what they buy, how often, and at what price. So this is research that was conducted by Cornell University, and they, they said that most people do not really know why they buy what they buy, eat what they eat, or do what they do. So knowing who your customer is key. Make observations of consumer trends and follow market research. Who are your ideal customers? And then cater your products and your marketing to these customers. Tell your story. So that, that involves being observant, looking around um, at markets. And so it could be the farmer's market, looking at retail stores, and really reaching your ideal customer. You don't need to market your products to everybody. It's that ideal customer who's going to buy your products. So test your test waters before making a major change. So you can survey your customers, you can talk to them about what they like, um, and maybe before spending a lot of money and time starting something new, go ahead and ask the customers first and try it out. Do some taste tests. Build relationships with your customers, and that will also help to um, develop this process of storytelling, developing rapport with your customers. And then be adaptive to change. So if something's not working, stop it or um, adapt it and evaluate your findings and keep moving forward. Figure out what your con competitors are doing. So you can often reinforce one another. Um, when you're selling at the market, for instance, if you're selling at a farmer's market, Notice the demographics. Are they primarily women at the market? Families? Are people looking for single serving items? So more and more people are dining alone. And are these customers maybe health conscious? Are they looking for fresh foods, uh, snacks? So you can often, through these observations, make little tweaks to your products and really um, get most bang for your buck. Also look at cooking magazines such as Bon Appetit or Sunset. So try to be ahead of the trends and not after. And one example that I um, really think of is in the 1990s there was this craze about emus and everyone wanted to have emu products. It was going to be the next meat. And this craze just didn't really fly. It went belly up in the 90s and people lost lots and lots of money. So the people who got into the emu trend late lost, um, lost out on that marketing opportunity. And um, so think about what's coming up. Who else is meeting the demand? And, help, and that will also help you to find your niche. Customers are looking for authenticity and your story. With direct marketing, you control what you produce, how much, where, and how you sell your products. And best practices include being yourself, 
showing up. So if your your business is closed or if you're a farmer's market vendor and you're just not there some week, that's not going to bode well with your customers. Develop relationships and then continually work on your brand, telling your story, and then also thinking about having an online or social media presence. So this is a farm. Deep Roots Farm, and they're located in northern Idaho, and they're telling their story and brand through keywords that are descriptive and help to reach their ideal customer base. So on their website, they had these keywords. They're a collective rather than a one-person operation. They're small scale. They use certifications like certified naturally grown to help with their branding and their marketing and so that their customers can get an idea of who they are. They're also trans they have transparent written on their site and in big capital letters they wrote local. So they're thinking about who their customer is and then really highlighting that on their site. So with their permission, I'd like to show you their manifesto. And you can have a manifesto of your own on your own website or other marketing materials, so whether that's printed or um, online. And see how they've highlighted these key descriptive words. So they're highlighting local with that three miles phrase or word there, words there. No synthetic chemicals. They this is um, asking questions has to do with their transparency and they're also saying that they support by buying local um, you're supporting other local businesses within your community and and when you buy from them you're supporting your local economy so knowing that food is more than just food it can be pleasure or entertainment it can also be local economic development way to build community to also reduce your environmental impacts of consumption if you're buying local food it links to past generations and stories so there's all sorts of things than just the food and the nutrition itself and with direct marketing, while you have greater control over your business and can earn higher returns, you need to meet consumer demand. You have less risk with your business than wholesale ch channels like the commodity market prices, but you're also required to do your own marketing distribution. So do you have the necessary skills or do you need to hire out for some help? to do this because the skill sets for growing food and then also on the sales ends of things and marketing are, are very different so really evaluating what you have the capacity for what you like to do and that's very integral to developing your marketing plan so we have another poll um, and I would just like to get an idea about who's doing some sort sort of direct marketing right now Great, I've launched that poll, Jen. So there's three responses. You're currently direct marketing your farm products. You're not direct marketing, but plan to start. And then you're just not direct marketing your farm products. Okay, we have 100% of folks that have voted. So I'm going to share the results. 78% of um, folks on the webinar today are already direct marketing their products. 11% plan to start direct marketing and another 11% are not direct marketing farm products. Great, thanks. So even if you do some direct marketing now, I'm going to give you some ideas about other possible types of direct sales and marketing that may help your business. And sometimes it's good just to um, kind of get an idea about what are the possibilities out there. And then even if you're doing something that really, um, that, like for instance, if you're selling at the farmer's market, there's some other 
complementary direct marketing approaches that may be pretty easy to integrate. So first we'll go over farmers market sales. And this can give you great experience, especially as you start out with direct marketing. And there's also lots of support for local food and farmers at farmers markets. The atmosphere can and can also help reinforce these cells and provide a boost to surrounding businesses. So first, um, one thing that farmers markets are really helpful with is if you're starting, if you want to start out, it can be an incubator for you and to get started. But then you can expand to other things, perhaps having your own farm stand, incorporating some agritourism, perhaps selling direct to restaurants or other retail outlets. Know that quality and diversity are important. And also just being in line with your marketing um, brand. Be aware that you need to be compliant with both market, county, and state rules. So do your homework in advance. And then also know if you're getting started that some markets have a wait list to, for you to be able to start selling. And so the past vendors typically are led in first or they're grandfathered. Other things that may affect your cells are weather and other environmental factors, and that's huge. Um, if the weather is really poor and it's raining and freezing, that might really affect your cells that week. So do some research and practice with setup beforehand. So if you're just getting started, maybe start as a walk-on vendor um, one summer and, and just see how it goes try some things out, you can test some products, and then um, be note that and, and learn from it, and then you can get started that next season. Are you able to set up your booth by yourself? So there's other factors like, can you carry the items? Can you set up a tent? That sort of thing. Or do you have someone that can help you with those things? And then part of this getting started is doing that reconnaissance, looking at your customers. Um, what are you looking around and looking at the competitors and other different vendors at the market? What are they doing? What could maybe be improved upon or emulated? And then in terms of pricing your products, be sure to um, have a fair price and not undercut your fellow vendors. And know that um, with direct marketing, you're not going to be selling at the grocery store. So um, you, don't, you don't necessarily need to price items the exact same price as that's at the grocery store. But also, you don't want to be totally in left field. So look around, see what other people are charging, um, and that will help you decide what, what is a, price, a good price for you. And then also, depending on your product, especially if you're doing some value-added products, um, be aware of the state rules. Idaho has the Cottage Food Act um, that exempts a lot of um, products for direct sales, but make sure that you're compliant with that um, and m develop a relationship with your local health inspector. They will often uh, do reconnaissance at farmers markets and so you just want to make sure you've got everything squared away before you get started. And next, um, community supported agriculture is becoming more and more popular. Um, basically, if, if you're unfamiliar with this, um, it's known as a CSA and customers pay up front for weekly shares of of the farm's harvest over a season. So that can be anywhere from 20, 12 to 20 weeks. And the customers get, a, get an assortment of products. So usually there's um, 10 or more products that a customer is going to get weekly. And members essentially own part of the farm for the season. So they pay up front um, and this helps to give the growers some early season capital um, 
help with their, some of their capital costs. And um, we can help them with getting seeds, um, getting started, that sort of thing. So this early season cash flow is great and it can help farmers lower their borrowing costs and, and help pay for those early season expenses. Another um, thing to keep in mind with community supported agriculture is that this is a really wonderful opportunity to help build your brand, develop rapport with your customers. So newsletters and recipes are very popular and recommended. Make sure that they're in line with your brand. So when you're developing your brand, make sure your logo is consistent, your colors, your font, all of that goes into your branding. And then also if you're doing online newsletters, just making sure um, that you have everything set up ahead of time, that you have a website or that you have social media that can help um, reinforce um, part of this, these brands. And then many times people don't know what to do with the produce or the items that you that are given throughout the CSA. So having some recipes in, on hand with your newsletters or with the share are, are also really helpful. CSA is also fit in really great with farmers market and restaurant sales and some CSA um, farms even have drop-off points at the farmers market. So next, um, another option is roadside farm stands. So with this, it's really important to be located in a, in a good spot for customers to um, be able to park and to know where you're at. So location is key. You need to get the customers to come to you. So you might have to have some long business hours. Um, and if you're not there all the time, you might need to also rely on the honor system when people come to the, to the farm to, to pay for some of the products or to go shopping. And actually, people are pretty honest for the most part. Um, but just be aware of that and then know what your site resources are so do you have ample parking is it safe to park um, do you have the necessary farm stand structures and just just be aware of all those planning things do you have the correct liability insurance so talking to your insurance agent will be helpful and then along the same lines with the roadside farm stands, the same goes with you pick. So this is really common for berries or pumpkins. It can help to lower your label, labor costs or time, but know that you can get some product loss due to customer error or carelessness. Um, realize that there's going to be people on the farm. Um, people might bring pets even though uh, you might have a sign that says no pets allowed. Just, just be aware of those things. And it can be really um, a wonderful complement to your farm, um, especially for developing some agritourism, um, helping to develop your brand and get your name out there in the community. And then the same thing with agritourism. So this is a growing trend, especially in more touristy areas. And you can get a premium for your product if there's demand. So agritourism can include anything from farm stands, you pick, could be corn mazes, you can do festivals, hay rides, uh, have music festivals, that sort of thing. Um, some farms, I know that in the eastern Idaho area, actually make more money off of their corn maize than their actual products. So um, it can be a great opportunity to to diversify your farm and to get some other extra revenue coming in and then you can use that local food movement marketing to really help with that um, there's certainly a buzz around it and people want to know where their food comes from they want to get that authentic experience of going to a farm so you can use all sorts of resources within your community to help spread the word such as the Chamber of Commerce or um, 
different tourism pamphlets. You can write press releases, uh, send out information about festivals or other events to your local papers, other media resources. So um, this is something to look at, and especially in the eastern Idaho area. I'm located near Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and this is a um, segment that we really haven't explored much in our community, and there's a lot of potential out there for some agritourism. So we live in a, the growing age of internet marketing. More and more customers are going online for convenience. And if this isn't something that you've um, really considered yet, um, know that think this is coming, that people um, are spending so much more of their time online and with social media, and they want convenience. We're, we're, we're so busy as a society. So with website and online sales, you can definitely work into the shoulder seasons with your products perhaps sell things that aren't during the, the main summer months um, that you'd see at a farmer's market, for instance. And it works really well for value added or packaged products. So those non-perishable non products. And there's a lot of websites that can help you get started, but know that there, there may be some fees for the credit card sales and building that into your price or, or, or telling the customers up front that there's an additional charge for that. The USDA Agriculture Marketing Service has an online um, directory that people can enter in their farm information. There's also other sites like localharvest.org or uh, even local sites, Slow Food in the Tetons, so in the um, Jackson Hole, Teton Valley, Idaho area, we have an online directory with that's on Slow Food um, in the Tetons website. And so tourists are going to that and figuring out where products are grown or if they can buy directly from the farmer there. So some best practices for websites. Um, are to make sure that you have quality content on the site, that it's not too busy, that, it, that there's clear navigation. And having those keywords highlighted throughout the site is really important. It helps to get your site noticed when people are doing searches. So Google now um, dominates that global organic search traffic by about 90%. So like 90% of online searches are done through Google. So making sure that you're really catering to Google is important. Have those keywords. So there's different ways of looking at um, advertising through websites. And one is to have, um, to really work on that organic or free search results. So when you do a Google search, you'll see at the top of the search that some of the content or some of the sites say sponsored. Um, and that is actually paid advertising. So those uh, businesses are using Google AdWords to make sure that their um, listing gets on that you know first thing, that first page. But in many ways, people just gloss over that. I know that I do. I kind of skip that paid advertising, and I look. I want that authenticity. So I'm looking for us what they call the organic, the free search results. And so that's where having a paragraph, perhaps having your manifesto on that main homepage, a paragraph just describing who you are, what your brand is, and then highlighting those keywords. Um, is really important. Those search engines, people often call them spiders, they'll be searching the, the World Wide Web and they look for those words. So if you were a customer and you wanted to look for your products, what would you type in in that search engine bar? You know, what are the words that you would think? You want to make sure your site has those words. And then often on the back end of your website, you, there's a place for search engine optimization. There's a place where you can highlight keywords. So I recommend that you buy your own domain. And um, usually it's 10 to $15 a year. And you can use um, some free sites, 
such as Squarespace or Weebly or WordPress or Wix. And um, those sites are really nice because they also have some cross-device compatibility. So they work with your smartphones. Um, and you don't necessarily need to spend thousands of dollars with a web developer anymore. Uh, a lot of those sites when you're building your website um, are Windows based and you just use some drop down menus. You don't need to know any of the um, coding in the background. It generates that for you. So um, the world of the internet and online and web sales is really changing and evolving. There's often tutorials as well and YouTube videos on how to create your own site with these um, different content management systems. So having at least some sort of presence on social media um, is pretty important, especially since more and more people are, are using Facebook, Facebook and finding um, information with those social media sites. So Facebook, there's different, um, there's a personal Facebook page that you can have or you can have a business page. If you're going to be using Facebook for your business, please get a business page. Don't rely just on your personal profile. Um, and that can also help you just be professional, stay within your branding, um, and it's, it's a little easier to manage. You can also run ads really inexpensively. You can set budgets from as low as like $5 to promote a certain post. Instagram is growing in popularity and these this social media platform primarily relies on photos and pictures and so you can write short little captions and then you can have those keywords you can make them as hashtags for instance and when someone's doing a search for that hashtag your page um, and your Instagram profile might show up. You can also, so Facebook and Instagram now are one company, so you can link your Instagram posts to Facebook. So when you're putting something on Instagram, it automatically gets posted on your Facebook business page. So Twitter's out there. I find that a lot of um, local people don't always use Twitter, but it's nice to at least have a profile, and you can also integrate that within your Instagram page. And so you're looking for shorter text and you can you know again you can like I said you can link those three accounts Facebook Instagram Twitter together um, but even if you're not actively using Twitter at least have a profile so someone else doesn't take it or, or take your name and Pinterest is also growing in popularity and it's great um, for sharing your recipes so if you have a CSA for instance you can put your recipes on Pinterest um, you can also link to blog content. So if you have a blog on your website and you're posting your CSA newsletters, um, you can link to that from, from Pinterest. And then just making sure if you have that website or blog, keep it updated. Um, and one thing that really helps with those organic searches when you're doing a, a online search, for instance, through Google, is to have that blog consistently updated because that new content, those new keywords are going to show up during the Google searches. It'll make your page show up early. So you're trying to get to that first page or so um, within that web search. And then having a digital newsletter is another possibility. So this is good, you know, for your CSA newsletters, um, keeping customers updated uh, about different products that might be available at the farmer's market that week, um, if there's special events coming up. So if you're a really, really busy person, I suggest just focusing on maybe a couple or, or maybe three of these platforms and do them well. Um, and then you can also link your accounts um, using platforms like Hootsuite to save time. So that's H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. Um, and there's other different um, platforms where you can just post something using that platform and then it gets shown up on all of the different social media sites. 
So next, um, another marketing approach that you can do is with retail and restaurant sales. So this is where customer service is key. Make sure that your product is um, high quality and presented well. So appearance is really important. Having uh, a clean product. And sometimes it takes educating the buyer. So this would maybe be the chef or the owner of the restaurant to educate them about what's in season and what you have available and develop solid rapport with them um, first and make sure that you're, co you're consistently communicating with them. So you can get higher than wholesale prices with re retail and restaurant sales, um, but you also take on the role of the wholesaler. So realize that customers want affordability, they want that, that high quality. Uh, make sure that you're navigating the customer expectations. So again, if it's a restaurant owner or chef, communicate with them. Say, okay, I'm going to have a lot of this product at this certain time of year, or we had some adverse event happen and we're not going to have what we expected. So develop that communication and really treat people the way you'd like to be treated. Return phone calls, build those relationships. So in summary, with direct marketing, you're the grower and you're also the retailer. So again, this is different skill sets that are often required. If you have a farm, maybe, and you don't like to deal with the people end of things, maybe hire out for someone or have a farm partner who likes to do that sort of thing. They like to do the website. They like to update things on social media. They don't mind talking to the customer. Know that each marketing approach has, has its own unique costs and requirements. So integrating the different marketing approaches can be really great when developing your plan knowing that they will reinforce one another so for instance you can do CSAs with farmers market sales or you can do um, web website sales along with um, your CSA or, or vi you know whatever you may decide and be aware of all the different requirements Tune to your customers' needs. So this is where it's really important. How do you want to be treated? Everyone wants to be treated well and with respect. So even if you're having a bad day, put a smile on your face. No one wants to go, to, for instance, to the farmer's market if you're all grumpy and, um, and buy something from you if you're, if you're not attuning to the, you know, the customer's needs. So fake it till you make it. And work on your interpersonal skills. So this can be developed over time. And um, again, if you're more of the introverted type and you don't want to do all this, find a partner who can. Um, because you can often really uh, get a neat you know, thing going for your farm if you, if you are aware of what your strengths and your weaknesses are and um, realizing that you don't have to be an expert at everything but who can you connect with that can help you out? And again, be professional and friendly. So um, just a word of caution, even with um, Facebook, um, be aware of what you post online and, and uh, how you're perceived. So that's where I really recommend people having a business profile and um, keeping that um, the public page. And if, if you're having your own personal profile, just be aware of what you put out there um, because nothing's really private anymore. And so just be smart and use some common sense. And then tell your story. So be um, own who you are. So be authentic and um, people are looking for that authenticity. So be yourself, be, be kind and professional and develop relationships and um, you'll be really uh, a step ahead. So before we go, um, the University of Idaho has all kinds of really great 
resources available for free download on our College of Agriculture uh, and Life Sciences page. So there's a link here on this slide um, that you can go to and then you're going to click on small acreage farming and there's all sorts of free resource publications. This is just a list of a few of them but there's lots of direct marketing resources um, even things like looking at what types of insurance you might have to have. Um, so there's a legal guide. Farm Commons is another resource for uh, looking at some of the legal issues for cell, drug marketing sales. Um, there's also a wonderful resource about getting started with uh, community supported agriculture. And then just to close out, um, does anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, let, let's see. Um, I'm gonna, we have one question, and that is, what has a greater impact in the way of video? Facebook, IG stories, IG video, or other? Well, I'm not quite sure, um, but I think they're all evolving and um, more and more people are looking at YouTube. So I didn't mention that in the slide um, that talked about the popular media, but you can create a YouTube um, profile and maybe put just a video that goes over who you are it, it's it's integrated with your branding what types of products you have and then you can link that to your social media platforms or to your website um, I know that the live Facebook videos are also really popular um, Instagram is growing in popularity but by and large Facebook still dominates the industry so um, I'd still work on Facebook, even though I know some people are really kind of steering clear of it. Um, know that that's still the dominant social media platform. So you can try different things out. I know that within Facebook, there's analytics, same with Instagram, that can look, get, that can tell you how many people are viewing your video. Um, and what you know some of the demographics how many people like your page or like your video or how many um, views you've had that week so be aware that there is that information out there and look at it and and then you can kind of do your own research but i don't i don't know which one has necessarily the most um viewing but youtube is huge and you can really link youtube to all your different platforms so does that help answer the question So I think that was a good overview, and uh, yes, that does help answer the question. One of the things that I heard from a flower grower yesterday is the way she's effectively using Instagram is to link that directly to her Facebook page. So she uses in post to Instagram primarily, but she has it connected to Facebook, so it's also populating her Facebook page at the same time. Yeah, and know that they're the same company now, so they have merged and um, like for instance, with my University of Idaho Extension webpage for my county, I, I have a, uh, an Instagram page and I'll post things on Instagram and I'll use those hashtags. But then when, when you make your post, it gives you the option if you want to link it to Twitter or I think um, Reddit's another one. Um, you can link it to Twitter, you can link it to to your Facebook page and so that just really saves time but also know that the platforms are used differently so you don't want to always rely on having the same post on just just using one platform so varying it up is important um, but Hootsuite is is one of those platforms that you can use to post to all the different social media um, uh, platforms out there so I know snapchat's growing in popularity and I I don't really have much familiarity with it but it's getting the younger demographics and so that's where Hootsuite can help you to get things you know integrated with that but just know that the main um, social media sites are 
Facebook and Instagram right now um, and then websites so your website is going to be that content that doesn't change very much so uh, that's known as the um, the static content so you're going to have your a link to for people to contact you there so knowing that on your website you might not want to have your if, if you're a farmer you don't want far, farmers or people to come to your farm and you want to keep that private maybe get a PO box and you can put the PO box on that um, having a phone number that people can, can contact you with and then even if you don't want your email address there a lot of those websites have a contact um, form that you can integrate and so they don't see your email but they can type in the, their questions for you and, and c communicate that way um, so there's a lot of things you can do um, you can even you know that that will help you to preserve your privacy if that's really important um, and and then just just being aware of how everything is linked and integrated and just trying to save time so using those resources that will really save your time because we know how busy farmers are Thank you, Jen. Are there any other questions? So I'm not seeing any, seeing any other questions for our audience. So I want to thank, thank you, Jen, for that great overview of different marketing strategies. I want to remind everyone on today's webinar that this webinar will be posted on the Cultivating success.org website and if you are interested in selling to restaurants and retail we do have a webinar posted on that website that was given last spring specifically about those intermediated markets and some research we found about what the priorities are across Idaho with that thank you for joining our webinar today and please take a moment to take our post webinar survey this survey is going to launch immediately after the webinar closes and it's a, a short very quick survey but your feedback is really important to us as we continue to do this online programming this is our last webinar for 2018 we will have a 2019 webinar series that will be posted in early January so that will be on the cultivating success.org website and we will be advertising it through our various Facebook pages and we hope that you have a great and safe holiday season and that we can touch base with you in the new year thank you again thank you